Greetings, children of the screen. Your friendly neighborhood nerd scum here once again, coming at you with another creator interview. Today, I am joined by YouTuber, creator of Area 51, The Helix Project, and proprietor of Pocket Watch Press, Dark Knight Nations, aka Trevor Fernandez Linkovich. What's up, man? Not much. Not much, dude. Thank you for having me on. And I, I look forward to talking a little bit about the book, talking about a little bit about old Pocket Watch Press, and uh, letting people know where how and why they should be picking up this book right on man so yeah guys again today we're going to be talking about area 51 the helix project the first issue is already out he's got his kickstarter for the second issue starting up right now they're gearing up getting ready to go so and by the way guys if you want to find that the down in the description below i will have the um link for it down there so definitely check that out so trevor why don't you give us just kind of the um elevator pitch if you will for the book absolutely first of all the second issue is currently available on kickstarter with about a week left uh and if you haven't been able to pick up issue one there are multiple multiple ways for you to pick up issue one through this campaign whether it's a reward tier or a potential add-on so make sure you read through the campaign page in uh, entirety so overall the series takes place in the 1970s ufo hysteric america sort of under the shadow of the cold war and obviously it's a very tumultuous time and not only the world history but in in a more sort of microcosm the american history i mean it took decades for us to get through this and so the united states military is pretty desperate to try to find a means to end the war and with the story taking place about 20 years since the quote-unquote first contact or the Roswell incident uh, I, that, that certainly comes into play with their solution. So uh, they, they start up this covert operation aptly called the helix project where they take extraterrestrial DNA grafted onto United States soldiers in order to try to allow them to be able to manipulate their genetic structure, AKA shape shift uh, on a molecular level. And that obviously has countless military applications, but really this is a story about us. It's a story about mental health. Uh, illness, identity, uh, loss, and and what all of that sort of summits to is at what cost does that come and to who? So for as much as uh, for as much as this story is a crazy sci-fi noir conspiracy tale, uh, it's also very very personal. Right on, man. And um, as I've read the first issue and a bit of issue two. Uh, what's already completed of it, that is. Uh, the way that you're inter like interweaving those different ideas and concepts together is really interesting and very well executed. Um, so what was the initial impetus behind just the general concept? Well, I mean, really, they say to write what you know, and I'm relatively young, so it's not like I have a wealth of life experience. And uh, when the, the idea for me to write a comic book series began... Um, or sprouted really in my head, I was actually studying molecular and cellular biology at the University of Connecticut. I did so for three years before I realized I wanted to be a writer. So what a kicker that is. <laughs> the joke's on you. I'm using all that experience and those tens of thousands of dollars to write a picture book, baby. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I wanted to really play around with my science background because there's nothing that irks me more than sci-fi that just feels like fantasy with things that sound like science. I wanted to take science and springboard into the fiction. Uh, so I'm really bringing a lot of that background here. You know, from issue one, we're dealing with uh, leukocyte antigens and, and, and we're going to be dealing with a number of other different sort of components to our genetic structure, various proteins that can affect that. Um, and and I mean, really the the whole sort of anatomy of the extraterrestrial species that we're dealing with uh, has a lot to do with the way that their body can sort of interpret information around them so that they're able to shape shift. So that's, that's going to be a lot of fun to play around with. Um, it's going to be like, uh, I mean, um, I, we're gonna, they're going to have we're going to have moments where we're really going to deep dive into that. And by the end of it, you're going to kind of vaguely know how a receptor protein works. So that's kind of cool. But that's really on the back burner. Um, <laughs> and and yeah, I, I mean, what what else want, made me want to tell the story is just to to have a sort of open expressionistic dialogue with the reader. You know, I, I feel like 
any good piece of art is a conversation between, in, in a way, right, a more expressionistic conversation, because everybody's going to get something different out of it, between the creator and and the the viewer or the reader. Uh, and that's very much what this is about. You know, I'm taking all of all of that that sci-fi energy and telling a story that I think most of us, if not all of us, can relate to to some degree, because at this core, uh, at the core, really, it's it's about a boy and his dad and and the and the 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 sort of difficulty that we all go through when we endure loss and sort of diminishing returns on our mental health that come from that and particularly when you have a story that is about extraterrestrials and human beings how does that equate into the sort of identity conversation you know so uh, I'm kind of doing my best to, to, to pull all of these different threads in here to make my own massive quilt that is this story. Nice. And again, like that, all the things you just said are what good science fiction is supposed to be, you know? Um, and I'm obviously paraphrasing here, but I think it's like the Isaac Asimov quote where it's like, you know, individual science fiction stories might seem insignificant to the, you know, the critics of our time, but at their core, they represent our one true hope for salvation if we are to be saved at all mm. paraphrasing but yeah like science fiction is the perfect ground to kind of interweave all the things that make us human into one story and be able to explore those in a meaningful way for your audience yeah a hundred percent um the and and it's i think at the core of it you know all all fiction tells us truths but wraps it in lies you know i'm i'm i'm, I'm, I'm telling you a big lie that really does have something meaningful and relatable at its center uh it's like a freaking tootsie pop man uh <laughs> that's that's quotable we should put that on a shirt right but uh you know it's that's what it's really all about at the end of the day i want you to be entertained and and i also want somebody to read this and feel something genuinely right on man so yeah viewers at home how many licks does it take to get to the center of area 51 the helix project You'll only know if you go check out the Kickstarter link that's in the description below. <laughs> right on, man. So my next question is one that I'm sure our audience at home is interested in, but also indie creators all over are interested in. You found some really awesome people to collaborate with you on this book. And I was wondering if you could speak to the process by which you went through kind of finding them and where you found them. Well, a lot of it, I think, is beginning to figure out what you are looking for and what type of story you want to tell. And you never really completely know until you start, I think. I mean, even prior to recording this, we had a conversation uh, just about how you don't really know a character truly until you've written them at least once. Um, and, and in that way, I think that, the, that this world was very much the same, especially considering it's the first thing I've ever really done that's, that, that's seen print. Um, and so when I was looking for a collaborator, obviously there were some sort of tent poles that I needed to establish one they had to be able to draw cool figures because that's sort of the, that's sort of the, 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 the center of, of comic books. I mean, comic books derived from the, the superhero stories of, of, of Batman and Superman. And, you know, to some degree, I do have to appeal to that sort of cool uh, bombast, but really, you know, this story, I wanted to have a sense of cinema to it in the way that we are quote unquote shooting it or the way we're laying down these these sequential images and, and orienting them on the page um so i wanted a, an artist who was going to be able to capture that uh, and the great thing about uh, marcelo is that he is really really good at knowing where to spot his blacks which for anybody that doesn't know is simply knowing where to put deep rich fields of black in order to give a, the world a sense of three-dimensional space and texture and just general depth uh and that was very important to me because not only do i want these characters when they're acting and expressing themselves to feel three-dimensional and I, to some degree real, it's not realism, but I want somebody to be able to look at this and, and think, okay, this is a person who I can invest in to some degree, but also like we're doing a cool story about aliens and shapeshifters. So I want it to look cool. I want it to look textured and badass. I mean, you saw in the preview of issue two as well, you see some of the test subjects of the, of the Helix project. And they, they kind of look downright gnarly. And I just on a reactionary level, I think that's cool and it's going to be compelling. But yeah, at the at the core of it, it is just the, the level of, of depth and texture that can be brought to the world. Um, and with the colorist, man, Marcio, I mean, he's just an uncut gem. He's so good. He knows what palettes are going to best sort of convey the moment uh, to the best 
capacity it can be conveyed while also knowing what's going to look good on print because usually when you're looking at stuff through a computer it's the colors are sort of registered by values of light but when you print you obviously don't have backlight to do that so it does so with four base colors which are referred to as cmyk and those are the four colors that your printer will use in order to mimic or blend to make other colors so not only does he know sort of what to do in the context of the narrative but he he's actually got a lot of foresight in knowing that it's going to look even better on the printed page, uh, which, which I can definitely appreciate. Um, but he is also a big part of the texture, you know, adding sorts of like mid tones between the, the, the sort of negative space and those saturated blacks that um, Marcelo is laying down in order to make this world just feel so much more alive. Uh, and I just, you know, I, I can't, I can't speak highly enough about the colors uh, because it, I, I mean, I went through probably 40 different people before I found the right colorist for this project. Um, and, it, and it goes to show you that every single cog in the machine of making something like this is important because it's, I mean, I don't think there's any one part that is particularly the lion's share of it, but really, uh, I mean, just essentially knowing that one misstep can throw the whole thing off. And for me, my intent of this is to curate an experience, one that is both entertaining and relatable. So in order to do that, we need everybody firing, fire, filing, firing, excuse me, on all cylinders. Um, and I feel confident that I've done so in the team that I've set up. And also to give credit where credit's due, uh, you know, I have Taylor Esposito of Ghost Cliff Studios lettering my book, who is just one of the, the best letterers in the industry. He's worked on all of your favorite characters. Uh, he's worked for all of your favorite indie publishers. He's done it all. The the sheer experience and know-how and instinct that Taylor brings to this book is unmatched. And it's such a sort of silent and 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 thankless job that a letterer has. And in a way, it's it's almost like the composer to to a to a degree. Right. Because the best compositions in film are going to be blind because they're they're pulling you into the experience. And that's exactly what the lettering does. Um, so yeah, many, many kudos to, to Taylor as well. Right on. Yeah. Letterers definitely do not get enough credit and their work can make or break a book. Uh, hardcore. There are definitely some great books I've read where the lettering, I'm just like, I have no idea what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's definitely, definitely cool. Right on, sir. Well, that takes me really nicely into my next question, which is, you know, you know, you've got a new company. This is your first book, not only as a company, but you as a creator. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, you're working with an international crew on this. So did that provide any, you know, extra obstacles or difficulties in terms of like lining up schedules or kind of uh, communication issues or anything like that? I mean, yeah, you know, when, when you're making a comic book, it's already you know, becomes a little bit trialsome because there are so many different hands that, that your, your idea, your vision goes through. Um, but it's, it's less, I guess, about the, the difference in time, because there's only about, uh, I don't think it's more than a two hour difference between uh, myself and my art team. But the, the thing is, is th they're also up obscenely early in the morning and I have a super unreliable sleep schedule. So if I want to be as efficient as possible and be able to communicate openly and, and see results immediately, I have to be up, you know, anywhere between the hours of five and seven in the morning, um, which is, is great that they're up and, and they're working. But uh, for me, you know, it becomes a little bit trialsome. And, and, you know, there are just certain things that, that you're always sort of conscious and trying to maintain one. This is my first time working on a comic. So, and these guys have all worked on comics for, a, you know, more than a decade. Uh, one of them, I mean, Marcelo has been working in comics almost as long as I've been alive. So, you know, there's a certain etiquette to maintain there, but there's also a certain sort of cultural etiquette. You know, I don't know um, what might not be offensive, you know, out, out West as opposed to in Europe um, or Latin American countries, I should say, because they're still out Western. They're in Southern America. I'm being a dingus, but uh, you know, I, I should say what, what is in, in like the, in the United States as opposed to other countries, just to make it a little bit more general. Um, so, you know, just trying to be courteous, uh, but also knowing when I need to batten down the hatches and, and say, Hey, we're going to, we're going to do it this way. And 
there isn't going to be a lot of room for debate. Where, whereas, you know, most of the time I try to make sure that the collaborative environment is open and welcome and then they feel like they can contribute their ideas because I feel like that's when we're going to get a product that is better than the sum of its parts. You know, I mean, I write full scripts. I, I'm very specific in what I'm looking for, but there's always a caveat at the top of the scripts because I always write a little letter to each member of the creative team before they read the script. Um, and in every single one, there is one consistent piece in it is that if, if there is something that you feel like you might have a better idea in, in presenting it your way, let's talk about it. Let's, let's see how that goes. I mean, an issue, um, in the second issue, actually, there's a cliffhanger. Uh, and I, I mean, the, no, none of the sort of plot of it changes. I had just had a very specific camera angle and shot size. And, and when Marcelo laid it out, he actually had a completely different camera angle. And I actually really liked what he did uh, as opposed to what I wrote. So we stuck with what he, uh, what he you know, did on, on the sort of layouts. Um, and we have situations like that all the time. But I like having this very communicable experience with these guys because you're going to get the interpretation of somebody who's been doing this thing for a long time, somebody who's newer and might have fresher eyes. And I, I think that if all level heads are kept, it just generates something that is, you know, a polymer of of a sort of younger excited energy and, and the, the energy of a veteran that is seen at all, you know? Right on. Yeah. And I mean, like in any collaborative effort, like the collaborative part is what's important. Like you have to feel like you're in an environment where people can, you know, give their own input, but at the end of the day, know that if that isn't what the person who's manning the ship wants, they have to know when to back off and be like, okay, I'll do what you want. And I will do it to the best of my ability to try to give you that moment that you want. And uh, mm -hmm. it's really great that you found a crew who has so much experience, who's also willing to play ball in that way. Um, and in fairness, they probably wouldn't have the experience they have if they didn't already have that as like a fundamental part of their artistic makeup um because yeah like uh just from filmmaking and stuff i can definitely say like i've worked with both sides of it and you always end up with a better product when you're in the environment where it's like best idea wins yeah that's the name of the game you know that's how you, i talked about my intent being to curate an experience and we're going to curate a better experience when when we have more minds working towards the same end goal um, and therefore all minds need to be sort of voiced and that's really important to me. And, and just as much as, as I, I take a lot of information in, there are moments where I have to st stick my foot down. Um, I mean, we, we've talked about it privately. There's a, a, a double page splash in issue one where I had two very, very sort of contrasting silhouette figures uh, in a flashback scene with nothing but the blackness and, and this very bright white rim lighting. And my artist really didn't want to do that. He, he wasn't, a, Marcelo was not a big fan um, of doing that. And I was very adamant about it. And we, we did a rendering of the, of the scene with it, without it. And then somewhere in between. And I was like, I, I just, it, it makes the image so much more striking. It brings a lot more sort of metaphorical significance to that moment. And, and for me, when you're curating an experience with a comic book, it's important to be conscientious of every single panel because unlike film, you don't have 60 frames moving a second or more, you know, you, every, every frame is a moment that you latch onto the, and, and I, I'm not saying a, one panel is a scene, but in terms of the economy of the storytelling, a panel space-wise is equivalent to a scene in a film. So it has to be memorable and it has to be striking. And so in that moment when we're doing a double page splash and, you know, I just, there was something just in my gut that said, we need to stick with this. And, you know, I, I do want to obviously make sure that I'm, I'm making a, a decision that is going to better the final product uh, and, and acknowledge the fact that I'm not a professional artist. You know, I have a, a pretty decent eye for comic book art. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an editor, so I do edit comic book art as well and provide critiques and editorial notes, but he has 20 years of experience. So I definitely didn't want to take his advice lightly, but again, for as many times as I do want to make sure I'm open to advice, something like that, I think did end up turning out being for the betterment of the moment. I mean, you've seen it. 
Yeah. Can you imagine that moment if if those two characters were not in complete silhouette? Yeah, like it's one of those things where like it's a very powerful moment and I can from an artist's point of view, I can definitely see his uh inclination to want to do it in one way, but you're absolutely right in that uh the moment is much more um it's much more suited to the way that y'all ended up doing it cuz yeah, visual storytelling as much as people talk about them as a whole they're about moments, you mm -hmm. know? That's what you really remember are these striking moments. And that's true in film, but like you were saying in comic books, it is paramount, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, like that's a great moment. And I think that y'all at the end of the day definitely make the right decision for sure. Thanks man, yeah. And again, it's, it's that's the thing. It, like you said, the best idea wins. And at the end of the day, everything's cool and we move on to the next page and you know god forbid next page he has an idea that was better than what i wrote in the script and we go with it that's what it's all about primarily I, I what's what's really important to me too is not only curating experience but making an artistic product that we all feel satisfied and satiated by i want to make sure that all of us feel like we have done something that we're proud of um i've i've said this countless times on on interviews and 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 things like that but i don't ever want somebody to look at this and go yeah this is the this is a first comic like no, I want you to be surprised that this is my first comic. And so I've, I'm bringing my A-game. I'm surrounding people that, that, that are, you know, firing on all cylinders in terms of their department of, of the, the creative process. Uh, and we're going to come together and we're going to make something that's kick-ass, you know? Right on. Speaking of stuff that's absolutely kick ass, uh, again, I've read the first issue, part of the second issue. You're really bringing a lot to this book in terms of style and subject matter and themes. So I was wondering, is there any other kind of uh, whether, other media, whether it be comics or movies or things of that nature that kind of influenced your overall kind of uh, work on this piece? Um, yeah, of course. So, uh, I mean, I can't point to any particular works of comics more of this sort of, I, I would say a general, tools that i feel like i am trying to pull from people that I admire you know the work with theme a lot of is inspired by the stuff that Dwayne mcduffie did through milestone um the the sort of ability to evoke tone and suspense i i i'm trying my best to pull a lot of what i find to be successful in brubaker at brubaker and what he's been doing in his phenomenal <laughs> uh um uh crime books he's been doing with sean phillips at image um and I, I'm trying to bring a, a level of deliberation uh, to a, to a, a diluted degree um, that that Alan Moore would bring. You know, I mean, everything mattered with Alan Moore. Every word, every 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 part of the shot, um, everything in the periphery, everything mattered. It meant something. And so, you know, part of that curates uh, a, a, an experience for this book that is retouchable it is something that people can reread over and over and over again and get something out of every time and yet the first time still feel just as profoundly impacted so that's really important to me um and outside of comics i think visually in terms of shot setup i'm, I'm a big tarantino fan uh i really like not only the the sort of eclectic nature of his films but visually what he's able to pull off with the camera um how he builds this sort of simultaneity of disconnect and intimacy i think is is really great and you know we talked behind the scenes about a particular moment in in those early pages of issue two where i'm, I'm trying to make a character feel very cold and disconnected um and uh ultimately very unpredictable and a lot of that visually was inspired by um reservoir dogs uh to what tarantino was doing with camera there and uh, that's a great place to pull from also because like it's very direct, you know, mm -hmm. um, in some of his latter work, he tries to get much more flashy, but sometimes the most direct route is the most efficient and the most effective. And mm -hmm. the shots that you chose in that issue too, which guys, I can't speak highly enough that you need to check this out, go check out the crowdfunding, get yourself a copy, get some great perks, like getting yourself drawn into the book and stuff those shots are fantastic and that moment builds in a great great satisfying way for sure thanks i appreciate that man yeah that's something you know we're, we're definitely trying to be conscious of and and um 
you know, the, a lot of that comes from my, my collaborators. Uh, you know, they inspire me just as much as, as these, these other figures that I've mentioned before, but, um, and it's, it's again, trying to make sure that I, I, I don't want somebody to look at this and go, Oh, this is a one for one of, of something. I, I want this to sort of feel like a puzzle, you know, and, and I want all the pieces to feel very individual, but all contribute to the same big picture. And so one, one piece might be, the, the sort of sense of suspense that you get in Fatal by, by Brubaker and Phillips. Another, another part of it might be the sort of deliberate visual thematic work that Alan Moore does in Watchmen. Um, and, and whether I do it to the, to the same degree of success is another story, but I, I want to try, you know, um, the, the, this book, I'm constantly pushing myself to do things as a quote unquote, director of this story and the writer of this story uh that i think are are probably more advanced than i am a writer but if we do pull them off that they mean paramount success in the delivery of the story um and i would rather swing for the fences and and make sure that those swings are are swings that i feel like i i can i can try right they're not it's not like you know i'm i'm attempting to tell some crazy shakespearean epic um, because I'm not, but I'm, I'm doing what I can to push the boundaries of my ability as a writer. And as a, you know, again, like it, when you write full script, you are kind of a director. Yeah. Um, so yeah, very much doing that, just, just pushing the boundaries. And I find that with each issue and issue two, you know, very much being the, the first example of that, uh, there's a, there's a definite level up, I think in the way that we're able to, communicate uh, a sort of sentiment or or a moment in in the story right on yeah and i mean it should be said that like uh you know in terms of the way i framed that question for the viewers at home it's like no art no piece of art exists in a vacuum everyone mm -hmm. whether they're aware of it or unaware of it is influenced by other things and what separates a good creator from a bad creator is knowing to identify the things that influence you and know how to balance them and remix those elements while adding your own original unique take to them in order to make something that in the end is fulfilling and again, from what I've seen of the first issue and then part of the second issue, y'all managed to do that very, very well. Like now that you've said the things that you were aware of that were kind of influencing you, mm -hmm. I can definitely see that in the work. Thanks. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, you know, like it's, it's, a, it's a tireless journey telling a story and you're, you're really, you never finish. You just have to let go sometimes. So the, so it's, it's always really good to hear that. Uh, I, I've, that I've let it to go when it needed to be let go, you know? Right on, man. Yeah. So as we've said multiple times now, issue one is in the bag. Issue two is gearing up and moving full steam ahead. In an ideal world, like how long do you kind of have this run planned out for? You know, is it going to be like a six issue, 12 issue or an ongoing type of thing? Yeah. At the moment, I'm looking at six issues. Um, ultimately, I, I think that, you know, I don't want to be afraid to break the outline if the story needs to break that um, in order to be fulfilling and satisfying for both myself and the reader. Um, but right now it's looking like the story is about six issues. If we can really take off over the course of, of each issue's Kickstarter, I'd love to just wrap up issue five as a, as a double sized book, omit issue six and just make this a much more digestible experience. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I would have preferred doing this as either two triple sized issues or three double sized issues because I'm very big in about the way that you digest the story. Um, and, and I feel like it totally changes the experience. So that's kind of the move from now. I think that there are, are potential legs for maybe small spinoffs um, and maybe a, a, another one shot here and there delving deeper into a character or maybe a backup story or something like that. If, if that's something that people seem to be into, but largely I, I think that this story um begins on issue one and ends on issue six right on well yeah i mean like with the world you've established what's really interesting about it is uh feels like the story you're telling is pretty tight and contained but you've established a pretty vast sandbox even in only the first two issues so like yeah there are multiple other stories that could play out in that sandbox um outside of this original story that you're telling so um it's very good world building and it leaves open a lot of opportunities for you moving forward 
Thanks, man. Yeah, that's that's definitely the goal. Um, and and I know I also don't want to constrict myself. You know, if I say if I say that there might be nothing later, if I come up with a, an idea that I think is worth, you know, reopening the hatch, I'll do it. But until then, I'm I'm happy letting this story and this narrative have its natural ending, and that's what's most important for me. Yeah, I mean, like, obviously, it'd be great to be able to do more installments and really capitalize on it. But the story is what's key. And as we've seen with so many movies nowadays, trying to build their interconnected universes is like, if that's what you're focusing on, the story that you're telling right now is not going to work, you know. Um, and so yeah. that's a very good impulse on your part to be like, yeah, I got this big sandbox I can play in, but this is the story we're telling. This is what you're supposed to care about. Let's do that the best we can and worry about the rest later. Yeah, and and there's also just the the the, the sort of notion that I want to tell other stories. I want to work in other genres. Um, you know, my I, I mean, I have another three stories in the sort of development stage that are all very different from one another and from the Helix Project. I mean, that the next immediate project is a supernatural political thriller, um, and so. You know, uh, there there are different different stories that I want to tell from different genres that have different things to say, um, and as, as especially as a young writer, I really want to develop and flex those muscles now to work with those different sort of toolboxes, and and some of them might align to varying degrees, but you know, I, I feel like if if you know because you never know it's not over people could hate it i don't think you will but you could i after i finish this story i, I do want to try to begin to find my space as a writer to figure out exactly what my identity is and and that's not to be said that i want to be pigeonholed in doing one type of story but i i do kind of want to figure out what i'm innately good at so that i also know maybe what sort of qualities or styles of writing that i need to work on Cool. Well, um, I do have one other question for you real quick, but before we jump into that real fast for the folks at home, I want you to check out the trailer for Area 51, The Helots Project. So let's take a look at that real quick. They say that people are just numbers. Statistics. Most people reject it. Individuals, that's all they'll ever want to be. But that's not me. There's something powerful about a symbol. The world embraces so many of them especially when they look like you. Big question is, what happens when they don't? There you go, guys. The trailer for Area 51, The Helots Project. It is just as cool as this trailer makes it look, I have to tell you guys. So, last question, Trevor. Now, this is not going to be about Area 51, The Helots Project, but I think it's equally as important. If there are any three intellectual properties you could write for in the world of comics, what would they be? Part of me doesn't want to, like, because obviously you have three, so you're, you're bound to kind of overbalance on one side. Uh, 
of course i have a batman story in my head um my channel is named after him i have i have a batman story for every occasion if dc just wants to be smart enough to let me get a long old run i have a long old run if they want to they want me to test the waters with a couple small stories i got small stories um i would love to go over to the other side of uh the comic book pond and 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 do a daredevil run uh, a lot of it inspired by john milton's paradise lost um my number three you know, I, I just blow it up and, and go Thor. Uh, I have a really cool Thor run, a lot of it that's sort of grounded both in the, the sort of Marvel Norse mythology and actual Norse mythology, uh, dealing with Thor's relationship with, with Odin uh, and how that sort of matriculates downward. And I think um, it, it just, it, uh, I, I'm not going to talk about it because I'd love to write it one day. So you guys are just going to have to read it when, when, when these companies wise up and let me write these books. So yeah, I think Batman, Daredevil, Thor. Right on, man. There you have it, people at home. Trevor Fernandez Linkovich, the future architect of the Dark Knight. Frank Miller, Scott Snyder, Grant Morrison. He's coming for you. You better watch out. <laughs> so uh, Trevor, before we go, is there anything else you'd like the folks at home to know or uh, to keep in mind? Well, primarily, you know, Nerdscum, thank you for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to shoot the shit and uh, talk about the book. Uh, and with that, I, I encourage everybody and ask you to please consider checking out the Kickstarter below. I think it provides a lot of value, both in the type of story that we're telling and the content inside the page, but also in the physical rewards themselves. The book is printed on premium quality, thick stock. Uh, all of the other rewards, I think, are, are, are very unique, like being drawn into the book as a murder victim, which I think is particularly cool. And I actually low key think it's in like one of the best written and best drawn scenes uh, in the second issue. So there's that um, uh, amongst really quality, really, really, really high quality, like Bella canvas t-shirts that I'm actually using my experience working as a, as a retail manager uh, back when I was a little bit younger in designing these products. So not only are they high quality material, but they're going to look good and you're going to be happy to wear them outside of just being a piece of memorabilia from a comic that I think once you read it will be very meaningful and entertaining. Uh, so please consider giving it a look. If not, if, if, if and I know money's tight, please consider sharing the link with me uh, or for me, I should say, and tag me on social media so I can properly thank you. Uh, and, and if you are to do so, all things publishing, you can find me at Pocket Watch Press on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, you can also check me out on Twitter at P Watch Press because Pocket Watch Press doesn't fit. Thanks, Twitter gods, by one letter, by the way. So that's kind of that's kind of harrowing. Um, if you want to check me out, giving sort of analytical reviews and discussions surrounding comic books that are not mine, where I occasionally also kind of tell you to go buy my comic book, uh, check me out on YouTube at Dark Knight Nation. Um, on Instagram at Dark Knight Nation and on Twitter at Dark Knight NAT25. Uh, just did a review of Tom Taylor's really stellar debut on Nightwing with Bruno Redondo. Had an interview uh, with a writer who is uh, significantly better than me uh, named Ram V. Uh, and we got more coming from it for you down the pipeline. And, and you'll also catch Corey there on occasion uh, having some really cool evergreen comic book discussions. So, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, uh, we have about a week left of the campaign for the second issue of the Helix Project. Again, issue one, very accessible through the campaign. If you give it a look through awards and the add-on menu, uh, please become a part of the, the Pocket Watch Press family. Consider giving that look, that book a read. And, um, you know, it, it, unfortunately, if the, if the book doesn't reach its funding goal, I actually get none of it. Uh, and the it, it sets Pocket Watch Press a, a ways back because I've actually already invested a majority uh, of my own money into making this book. So I'd love to actually be able to have it see the light of day as issue one already has. So I, I'm just thankful for the opportunity to be able to talk about it. I'm, I'm thankful to be able to have this conversation with uh, the one and only Nerd Scum. And uh, I'm thankful to those of you that consider giving it a try right on guys so yeah as i said issue one is absolutely dope you want to see issue two check out the crowdfunding for it also check uh check trevor out over on his youtube channel and thank you guys very very much for joining us this evening i really hope y'all have a good one peace nerd scum out <laughs>